All right, kiddos, you guys are going to stay. We're going to uh, talk about the parable of the sower and the seed. I think you have like a little worksheet about it as well that you can pay attention and work on that at the same time. Uh, I think there's definitely something dangerous. I've, I've talked about this before. I think there's something dangerous in kind of the internet age uh, where truth is, you know, when, when I say truth is gone, I don't mean like actual truth is gone. It's the way that humans perceive truth has changed so much over the last uh, you know, couple decades. Uh, but even the way the news talks about truth it is in terms of like poll numbers. Like, well, 85% of people believe this. And you're like, oh, 85% of people believe this. Like, we talk about truth in terms of what percentage people believe. And when you're in the majority, when you're like, well, good, like, well, we can't all be wrong. All right, we're comforted by the fact that, like, look at all these people. Like, of course we're right. All right, but when you're in the minority, you're even more comforted because you're like, most people are idiots. So if they believe that, it's got to be wrong. You know, I'll be on the side of Jesus. He was always in the minority. You know, like, so whatever the number is, it's not like the poll numbers change how we feel. We're just comforted one way or another. But I think the real question is this. What I think is happening is that what people, what I believe is right. And if other people believe that same thing, then they're right. All right? And, and, and so, like, am I always right? Yeah, of course I'm always right. Are you always right? Well, when you agree with me, you are. All right? And, and the problem comes when we get to God's Word, where real truth is found. Because you ask yourself, does Jesus always agree with my point of view? Now, if you're spiritual, you'd be like, I always agree with Jesus. It's the other way. It's the other way. But he says something I believe. Uh, yeah, then we twist what he means to light up the believe. Uh, the reason why Jesus shares parables, the reason why he does this is he knows he's going to rock the boat. He knows that even from his followers' point of view, he is saying some things that are so jarring, that are so um, you know, heavy, that he needs to tell it in kind of story form in order to help the weightiness of what he's saying kind of be mellowed out a little bit with little sheep and little you know, seeds and like little softer subjects. He uses parables to teach very simple things that are very deep. Right? Very simple things that are very heavy. You know, and just because something is heavy doesn't mean it's not complex. Like if you have, I don't know if you ever picked up like an anvil. All right, it's just like a solid piece of metal. It, you can't pick it up. It's hundreds and hundreds. It's very simple. It's very simple. It's very heavy. And that's how I view these parables. That they're simple. They're not complex machinery. All right, they're not all really complex stories that take years of analysis. They're, they're actually very simple stories. But they're really heavy. And, and what God is doing here is he's going to mess with your point of view a little bit. He's going to affect your thinking about the kingdom of God most specifically. And he's warning you. Now, maybe some of the things aren't as shocking to us because we've been in church for a long time. And we're like, yeah, I get this. But there are going to be parables that are like, huh, I, don't, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah, you, there should be aspects you're like, I don't like it. All right, and this is why he's telling a parable so that it can uh, help soften the blow of the intensity of what Jesus is talking about when it comes to his kingdom. Uh, when we talk about parables, this is our little parables one on one. I'll review this over a couple weeks. Uh, parables are the simple stories. To present simple truths. Of course, if you want to follow along in the app, you can fill a little blanks and see the verses in there. Just go to our app, Sunday mornings, and you'll see some things. So, parables are simple stories that present simple truths, okay? Parables aren't real life stories. These aren't like things that actually happen. They're, they're, they're examples. They're, they're, um, you know, they're symbols. They're little, not symbols. They're, little, they're just little simple stories. They're not real life events. God, Jesus does share actual real life stories. But parables aren't those. This is, these are just little examples, little sermon illustrations that he's doing. They're simple stories that present simple truths. When you start making them complex, 
is when it'll, it'll break down, it'll stop working. Just like I think any illustration, when you think about it enough, it stops working. Jesus knows this. And so he makes parables, very simple stories, to prevent, uh, present very simple truths. We're going to, in the future, we're going to point out some examples of how even very godly people throughout history have drawn out little details in the parable and drawn out like these big, you know, big scriptural principles that really, I'm like, I don't think that's there. You, you grabbed a little, you're trying to identify exactly what the soil is versus what the bird is versus what kind of seed. If you go to, if you make the story complex, the story breaks down. So just always remember, they're simple stories and they have simple points to them. Take the simple point. All right, the, the first question I always ask when I come to a parable is who's the audience? It's gonna help me understand. <laughs> Because when I see an audience that's like the disciples, we know it's going to be like, hey, I'm trying to help you understand something. It's usually going to be kind. It's usually not attacking. It's usually something like, all right, start thinking deeper on this, disciples. However, if he's telling this parable to a Pharisee, or worse, a lawyer, all right, if he's telling a parable to one of them, what's happening is now it's probably going to be a little bit more cutting. It's probably one of those stories where I think of like Nathan telling the story to uh, King David that you know a man had a thousand sheep and yet and, uh, his neighbor had one sheep and yet the man with a thousand sheep stole the man with one sheep and David is incensed and he's like, tell me who did this? Who is the man that stole the man who only had one sheep? Tell him, I'll kill him. It was you, David. You know, it's this... It's this cutting, it's this like, whoa, is that about me? Many of the parables are underhanded. They're showing the Pharisees for the deceptive snakes and foxes that they are. And, and so when I see that the audience is a Pharisee, a religious leader, I know it's going to be cutting. I know it's going to be a little bit of a backhanded, like, I'm not just going to insult you because you'd arrest me for that. So I'm going to tell you a story that insults you, and by the time it kind of starts clicking in, I'll be gone. All right? And so who is the audience? And the third question is, what question is being asked? I think a lot of times, if you could just identify what question is being asked in many of the parables, I'd say about two-thirds to three-quarters of them, there's actually a question being asked to Jesus. And his answer is a parable. He knows if he answers it plain and simple, that, again, it would either complicate the ministry in some way, it would, they wouldn't be able to handle the answer. Sometimes we can't just handle yeses and noes. We need it like, you, need, you kind of need to break it down a little bit with a parable. And so a lot of times with a question being asked, here's the answer. And so when I keep reminding myself of the question, it's gonna help me, well, what's the answer? What is he actually answering here in a subtle way? All right, and so, but sometimes, again, as we're gonna deal with today, there isn't a direct question being asked. I have to play Jeopardy, which is figuring out the question. Here's the answer. What's the question being asked? All right. And so sometimes I have to kind of work backwards and figure out, okay, what question is he answering here? And I think we'll be able to do that no problem today. So as I said, we're going to start with kind of the classic, uh, maybe most famous parable, the sower and the seed. All right. And when we start with the sower and the seed, it's actually a really bad example of a parable. <laughs> because everything I just said is going to be like, well, didn't you just say this? I said, I did. But Jesus makes an exception here. All right? And he starts out with, uh, and, and depending, you know, it, Mark is the first parable show. I'll explain. Matthew, he doesn't use it as the first one. So we don't quite know where this is at in his ministry, but it's clearly somewhat early on. He's still kind of drawing big crowds in the Galilee region. This is early on in his ministry. All right? He hasn't headed towards Jerusalem yet or anything like that. So early on in this ministry, he shares this story. All right, what makes this a little bit unique is that he takes time to explain the parable. He does this twice, and he only does it twice. All right, where he actually explains the parables that he's sharing. And when he explains it, he explains parables with more details than I think we should try to explain parables. And my answer to that is, he's Jesus. He's allowed to explain his parable further. And when we try to explain his parables further, we're going to mess up. But even in his explanation, I'm going to show that I, I think he's giving little examples rather than saying, this is the way you're supposed to interpret this. 
He's giving them ways to interpret it. Uh, but the same truth shines forth at the end, which is the point he's trying to make. Who's his audience? It's a crowd. All right, his audience is a crowd, which means the audience is filled with good and bad people. It's filled with people who are truly earnest and wanting to hear what Jesus is asking. And there are people in the crowd sitting there with their notes trying to figure out, like, when he says one thing against the law, I'm going to pin him against the wall. So there's both people in the crowd, people wanting to listen and learn and people wanting to trip him up with his words somewhere. But it's going to be a general audience. He's got a pretty general message here since it's a pretty general audience. It's not just his disciples. It's not just Pharisees. It's a widespread variety of people. So that's his audience. Now, what question is being asked? Now, clearly, in the passage, there is not a clear, here's the question being asked. Like, there's many times you'll see someone, like, actually raise their hand and, like, uh, I have a question for you. Oh, I see that. And there isn't a question being asked. He is teaching, and he simply says, I got a parable for you in the midst of the teaching. But I think the question being asked, or right, the implied question is, here he is in front of this crowd. Usually, when he was teaching, it's his disciples. Small little crowds. And all of a sudden, there's a huge crowd of people. And the implied question is this. Are all these people now disciples? Is everybody here in this crowd part of the kingdom of God? Is everybody in the crowd a follower of Jesus? And this is the answer to that question. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him. So they got into the boat and sat in it on the sea. And a whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teachings, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came to devour it. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seeds fell amongst thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil, and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, and sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. So picture this. Here's this crowd of people. A whole, a, 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 a giant crowd actually gathered in this town. Again, usually with smaller groups listening to him. And, and so what they do here, they kind of picture this in the show The Chosen, that he ends up getting on a boat so that he can go out a little bit into the ocean so that when every, the whole crowd, if you're standing in, you know, too close to people, people way over there, so he backs up a little bit so he can talk to the whole crowd. And he's telling them, he says, listen, some of you, I'm tossing this, this good seed of the word out there. Some of you are going to hear it. Or excuse me, all of you are going to hear it. Yet some of you, it's going to get snatched away. It's going to get choked out. It's going to get dried out. But when he said to them, you don't understand this parable. This is an easy one. How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown, and when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones when they hear the word immediately, receive it with joy, and they have no roots of themselves, but endure it for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises and accounts of the world, immediately they fall away. Others are the ones sown among thorns, and those that hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word out. And it proves unfruitful. And those who are sown in the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And so as I'm listening to this parable, I know what then we have the tendency to do in future parables. Okay, there's birds. Oh, that's Satan. Oh, there's thorns. Uh, there's thorns. Okay, that's when, you know, like trials and tribulations. Oh, actually, that's the, that's the right. The right, right. Oh, that's when thorn or uh, tribulations and trials come along. And yeah, it's just like too difficult. It's too rocky. 
Oh, and there's the uh, the weeds that are choking us out, the thorns. Like that's when like other desires of this world like choke out our love for Jesus because we start pursuing riches or start pursuing pursuing fame or love or some other thing. And so what we do to other parables is the same thing that Jesus does here. But I actually don't think that's what he's doing. He's simply giving examples of like, yeah, you know, you should know what this means. Like to getting snatched away or something. Like these are the examples. But the point is not about, you know, like, well, how does Satan snatch us away? You know, what does it mean? Can you, you start to grow, but then you, are they actually saved and they lose their salvation? Or what kind of fruit needs to be produced? None of this is the point of what he's trying to make. All the little side details of, of the birds or Satan and the, the rocks or temptation or your trials or the, uh, the thorns and temptations, like all those things are just little details that are driving home the main point of the story. The main point being that when we spread the word of God, some believe and some don't. Some believe and some don't. All right, so that is the simple truth. When I, uh, I went to a Christian high school and a Christian college, and I see this. I've seen this over and over again. I had a really small graduating class. I graduated with 17 people uh, in my graduating class. So it's kind of easy to follow them. You know, we're just, we, weren't quite, we didn't quite have Facebook yet, but after a couple of years and after college, we all had Facebook. It was easy to just friend everybody in the class. And, uh, we all get to follow each other. And it was easy to see the ones that have continued on and continue to be faithful, continue following Jesus. It's really easy to see the students that, man, maybe... Maybe they, they believe, they're not like atheists, but they're like, they don't really seem to be going to church. They don't really seem to be, they don't seem to talk about God in any way, shape, or form. Like, it's just, if it's a part of their life, it's a small part. All right? And then there's people that are just out and out, like, anti-God, anti-the Bible, anti-church, anti-Christianity in everything they post and everything they say. How could we all go to the same Christian school, go to the same church that most of us Go to the same church, uh, like, hear the same things. We all had the same Bible classes. How did some come to the conclusion that, oh, this is all just garbage? How did some listen to that and say, like, oh, this is all just fake, it's all stupid? And other of us heard it was like, wow, I can't believe Jesus did that for me. Wow, I can't believe, uh, like, this is what God did to create his world. Wow, I can't believe that we heard it and we believed it. And the answer is he's telling us. He says, listen, some, some people, it's rocky ground. Some people, they get snatched away by all sorts of different things. I, I just think of when I think about some of the people I, I graduated with, I, I see uh, that they were kind of snatched away by sin. There's definitely, when you go to a Christian school, there's like lots of rules. And it kind of is the norm to kind of go with the flow of everybody else. And then all of a sudden you graduate and you kind of have nobody telling you what to do anymore. You kind of don't have anybody like tell you go off to college. You're not, you know, there's not any parents around. There's not teachers around. There's not even other fellow Christian, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ around. And so you just start saying like, I'm going to do all the things I wasn't allowed to do. And they almost like binge on sin. But if they were just went to a public school, like, listen. You gotta, you gotta hedge your own. I can't be doing this all night long. You just do a little bit of sin because I've been sinning my whole life. And now all of a sudden you've been like holding back to sin. You're like, ah, it's just this explosion of sin uh, when they go to college. Uh, I see others that, uh, you know, they, I think one of the problems, and it's something I talk about with people at Christian schools, is that we don't always present. Um, you know, we don't always present atheism, or we don't always present, you know, Hinduism, or present Buddhism, or present Islam, or present things in, like, a fair way, and meaning, like, this is what they actually believe in. This is the arguments that they would use to point out, like, I, I get, when I went to a Christian school, like, we were only taught creationism. We were never taught evolution at all. And all we were taught was that, you know, evolution is a joke, and creationism is the only thing that has facts to it. But if you teach that way, when you then go to public school or get on the internet, you're going to see, like, actually, there's a lot of really interesting, like, there's a lot of interesting evidence for evolution. There are some aspects 
that like, how do I explain this as a creation? Is that if I never have ever been engaged with a difficult argument, there are things that creationists look at and you're like, you know what, I don't know what to do with that piece of information. Let's keep studying it. You know, it doesn't mean that like, oh, it's all a lie. It's like, no, there may be an answer. I just don't have it yet. And that kind of fair way of treating it. So what happens is then kids would leave their Christian school or leave their church or whatever it is that they're a part of. And then they actually get to hear coherent arguments as, as opposed to just them saying like, oh, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing valuable about, there's no proofs that, or there's no proofs about evolution. There's no proofs that there's anybody that doesn't believe in God is an idiot. And then all of a sudden you listen to someone and you're like, actually, that's a really interesting evidence for why God doesn't exist. And I've never learned to argue against that. We call this apologetics. I've never learned to argue against that. I've never heard the best arguments to actually be able to chew on them now in a safe space. And so what happens is they are finally exposed to other beliefs and worldviews. And they start deconstructing what they believe. They feel lied to. And because they feel lied to, they're like, okay, everything must have been a lie. And then they start getting choked out by these other beliefs and other worldviews. And I think others just dried out when they were in a place with prayer every day, and when they were in a place with worship once a week, and they were in a place of reading God's word every day. There is a lot of benefits that come from that. If you just take any person and you're praying a lot and reading the Bible a lot and worshiping a lot and around fellow believers a lot, there's a lot of just kind of benefits that come from that. There's a lot of quote-unquote growth that can occur around that. And then all of a sudden you take all that away and you go for the summer and you leave and you go into a new school or you go into your job and there's no prayer and there's no reading the Bible and there's no worship and there's no fellow Christians. It's easy to dry out. It's easy to dry out. Now when we look at that and I look at those friends and, and all of them but one in our class. Every uh, 16 of the 17 people in our graduate class all claim to be Christians. There was one girl that was pretty like, you know, not like, she was super quiet, but she was like, eh, I don't know if we're gonna this stuff. And we would share the gospel with her a lot. But 16 of the 17 people that we graduated with were believers, tested to be believers. Now, I'm looking, four or five seem to still be believers. All right, uh, from what I can tell on Facebook, we actually have our 20 year reunion coming up. I'll get to talk to some of them face to face and I'll maybe adjust my day. Uh, but there's a couple, of, but there's so many that clearly, in every, that all their words and deeds are believers. So did they lose their salvation? Is that what this parable is saying? That, yeah, there's some that they start to grow, but they don't have roots until they fall apart. Or there's those that they start to grow, but then get choked out. Is that starting to grow, meaning they're a believer? And I just say, no, we can't lose our salvation. But that's certainly not what the parable is saying. The parable is not getting into that. The simple truth of the parable is simply that we spread the word of God and some believe and some don't. The sower, the parable of the sower and the seed is about the sower and the seed. The sower passes out the word, and the seed either takes root and grows and produces fruit, or it doesn't. Or it doesn't. So uh, the fear that we all have, the fear is that, well, am I good soil? How do I know if I'm good soil? And according to the parable, if you are producing fruit, you are good soil. If you are not producing fruit, you're not good soil. All right? And so when you're looking, you're like, how do I know if I'm good soil? If I'm producing fruits. If I'm producing fruits, I know I'm good soil. All right? it's, it's, it is circular. All right? But the answer is simply, are you good soil? And if you are, you'll be producing fruits. Uh, I think of, I've told this example, George Whitfield, when he had a, a, a huge crowd, he was part of the Great Awakening, he shared the gospel and literally just hundreds of people come to Christ. When he does an altar call, hundreds of people go forth. That I was when I was at a Billy Graham crusade when I was in eighth grade. You know, it was just a sea of people in Raymond James Stadium. Just a sea of people just heading towards the field uh, as fast as they could getting saved. It's cool. It's exciting. But when George Woodfield was asked, hey, how many people I want to put in my newspaper article, like, how many people do you think got saved today? And his answer was like, oh, I don't know, we'll find out in about five years. All right? His answer is, if, it's some, if it takes root, it was real. If it takes root, it was real. All right? Like, you know, I, I don't 
know enough about seeds. If I was handed like a whole bunch of seeds, I would be able to tell you like which one's a seed and which one's a bead, you know, which one's a sprinkle. Like, I don't know. I'm going to put them in the ground, and the ones that grow, I'm going to know, okay, that was a seed. All right? That was something that was real. So when I spread the word of God, I'm going to know who the real believers are if they grow and start producing fruit and start spreading the word themselves. This is how we're going to know if they are good fruit. So why is Jesus telling us this? I always want to ask this when we think of application. Why is Jesus telling us this parable? The kingdom of God is both really simple and yet so few produce fruit. But those few, those proud, those believers will produce a lot of fruit. All right? And, and, and this is certainly more of a warning than a marketing strategy. He's not, he's not telling us, like, yep, just keep spreading more fruit. You don't spread as much as you can. He, he's actually just telling us this is a warning. Like, not everybody that hears these words from Jesus believe. I, I think that's something that comforts me. Here's Jesus preaching himself, preaching to a crowd, and a huge majority of this crowd don't believe. Jesus! You would think that, like, well, if Jesus was up here, everyone would believe Jesus. No, they wouldn't. Clearly, in Scripture, Jesus is preaching. Jesus ends up with, like, these 12 guys at the end of the day. And even one of them is like, eh, I don't know. All right? Like, so few. These huge crowds of people, we get to the book of Acts, and once Jesus is resurrected, it kind of, it is who, like, he proved it. Boom! There's 120. <laughs> There's 120 up in the room of all the crowds that people talk to. The 5,000 people that he fed. At the end of the day, there's 120 up in the upper room. So there's huge percentages of people that heard Jesus' words and don't believe. Didn't follow. Maybe they believed it. There's been probably people like, oh, wow, that's really uh, interesting stuff. I like it. I like it. All right, let's do it. You know, like, they're not anti it. They're not, there are some that's like, no, no, I have something wrong with it. I'll figure out what's wrong with this. But even Jesus, in his preaching, he's telling his disciples, he's telling those who believe, like, yeah, you're going to share the word with a lot of people, and it's not going to take root with a lot of people. It's not happening with me. It's definitely not going to happen with you. You're going to spread the word, and for a lot of people, it's not going to seem to go well. But man, is it amazing what it takes root. Is it amazing what it takes root and starts producing fruit? So what's success in the kingdom of God? The point of the parable is certainly not, yeah, that's why we, we dig up the rocks to prevent trials from happening. That's why we build scarecrows to chase away Satan. That's why we, we pull all the weeds into things to make sure it's fertile ground. He's actually not giving us that kind of mandate here. He's not telling us to till the soil, to prepare, make sure this soil, get better soil, get better. He's not telling us that at all. all right? He's simply just telling us, hey, you're going to have to share the word with lots of people. All right? I love the, the picture right in the beginning here. You know, it, it's a little indiscriminate. It's like, hey, all the time, everywhere I go, I'm spreading the word. I'm spreading the word. I'm not actually thinking about, am I getting it in the good soil right? I'm just spreading it as I go. All right? I'm just spreading it as I go. He's not telling us to make good soil. He's simply telling us not everyone you meet is good soil. All right? And, and this is important. And, and this is the thing that I think is meant to rock us a little bit. We're not to look at people and to try to figure out, are they good soil? We're not supposed to look at people or groups of people or individuals or this neighbor versus that neighbor and say like, yeah, that neighbor, they could come to Christ. This one over here, no stinking way. That's, that's a thorn. That's a thorny push of a house if I've ever seen one. Or like, oh, that's as rocky as it gets across the street there. We are not to look at people to try to determine what kind of soil they are. There is no target demographic for Christianity. There is not a target demographic. 
It is not something you can look at and say, like, oh, like, oh, yeah, you know, if they're really in need, or oh, if they're really this, or oh, if they're really that, or if they're this color, or they dress this way, or if they look this way, or they care about these things, or if this is their worldview now. We are so often looking for people that we think will be good soil. Alright? And again, as someone that knows nothing about farming, nothing about planting, it's not just, oh, you got dirt. There's certainly dirt that's been like, oh, all the minerals are out of there. You have no idea that it might look good. Nothing grows here. Nothing grows. Alright? And, and so when we can, when we look at people and try to determine who's good soil, this is breaking this commandment. God is simply saying, share the word. Everybody, everybody in your life, you're sharing God's word, his love, his this. You are just sharing with people. And what you're going to see is, you're going to see like, whoa, it, it took root that person. I just wanted to think of like some famous people. I'd be telling just personal stories of my life. you would be like, good story. I don't know who you are. Uh, you know, Alice Cooper is a Christian. Like, I've heard his testimony multiple times. Like, he really seems to love Jesus. You know, Brian Welsh from Cord, the guy that was Ruby Rock, Chris Tucker, like, he just turned down $12 million to appear in the next Friday movie because he just says, like, it, it doesn't fit with my Christian values. Like, he's like a stoner in that movie. And so he's like, I, I can't do that anymore. Sorry. And he even pitched that he could be, like, a Christian in the movie, and they're like, oh, that's not funny. And they're like, I got this one. And they offered $12 million to turn it down. Kanye West, you know, I don't know. It's so early. It's still early. Like he's put out two albums now, all about Jesus. Uh, all right, maybe a third, uh, the third one. That's what it really gets. I don't know. Uh, you know, Chris Pratt goes to church every Sunday. I don't know if that means to move. Mr. T seems to be a Christian. He talks about Jesus a lot. All right, you know, who would have looked at like B. A. Baracus and said that? Oh, Baldwin brother. One of the Baldwins is a Christian. Uh, you know, then you got people like uh, David uh, David Berkowitz, son of Sam. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer have both claimed to accept Christ. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, don't, I haven't talked to him. I've seen some interviews. I've, I've seen interviews on both sides. People that seem to say that um, he's, uh, you know, like, oh, he's just playing a game. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But remember, fertile soil is the one where seeds grow. Fertile soil is the one where seeds grow. I don't know. What we can never, ever do, ever, 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 what we can never do, never think someone deserves it, never think someone is more likely to believe, never think that someone uh, is more worthy of the, the gospel. Jesus is shared in this crowd, and, and he doesn't go through. He shares the good news with the crowd. What he doesn't know, even though he's Jesus, he, he gives us this example of follow. Where Jesus would be one to know, he'd go through the crowd like, all right, you, 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 like he he can literally go through and like like uh, you go. I, I'm going to just talk to this crowd. You guys are my believers. You're going to be the ones who believe. But he doesn't do that because he knows we can't do that. He knows we wouldn't have the ability to do that. We would, like, what example would we follow in that? So what he does, he shows, I'm just going to share the word. I'm just going to take the seed and toss it out there. I'm just going to toss it out there. And with the way, where it grows, it was good soil. It was good soil. You never know. You never know. All right? And let God do an amazing work with whomever uh, he sees fit. And we, there's a, obviously a bigger principle behind it. Like, why does it start growth? Not dealing with the parable. The parable is us. We're the crowd. And he's telling us, all right, if you are producing fruit, you're good soil. And when you go out and start spreading that seed, you start spreading that seed from the fruit, just keep spreading it. It's not going to take root everywhere, but it's going to take root somewhere. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray this new year, of all the little New Year's resolutions that I'm sure we have, uh, we all want to eat less sugar, and uh, we all want to work out more, uh, and you know we want to read more of your word. I also pray that part of our goals are, yeah, I want to share the love of God with more people. I want to share the word of the Lord with more people. I want to share.
the good news with more people. I want to share the gospel with more people. God, let us never look at someone and think, oh, not that. Oh, doubtful. Oh, unlikely. Like, oh, never happened. Oh, never going to happen. Let us never look at people like that. Let us look at everyone and say, hey, here's some seeds. I'll give you some more seeds later, too. <laughs> we have no shortage. We're never running out. We're never running out of the Word of God. We're never running out of your truth. We're never running out of your gospel. It's not a finite supply that we get to we get to just share your word, the love you have for us. We get to share that with everybody around us. God, we love to see your word take root for people to get to enter the kingdom of God. People to be able to understand that they're a center of need of a Savior. We love you. We praise you, Jesus. We pray for this food that we're about to eat. I uh, always pray for this time of fellowship. This, we have an enjoyable time just talking with each other, encouraging each other, challenging each other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, I know some of you did not know that there was lunch today.